The views, comments, stories, and opinions shared within this podcast are my own or those of my guests and in no way represent the views of the company or companies that I or we work for. All stories, events, and tales shared within this episode may or may not have happened in the manner in which they are told. They may or may not have even happened at all. The details have been changed to protect the innocent and the guilty alike. This is Squawk Ident. You're listening to Squawk Ident an aviation podcast dedicated to the journey and the challenges surrounding the life and career of Aviator Tony and his guests. Together, we will explore the many pathways to an aviation profession, the realities of what a professional aviator can expect in today's marketplace, and we share many stories along the way. I'm your host, Aviator Tony, an airline pilot currently flying for a legacy airline with close to 20 years on the flight line. This is episode 29 of Squawk Ident, recorded on the 28th of February, 2020, from the Aviator Remote Sound Studios from Studio 820 of the Hilton Garden Inn in downtown Phoenix, Arizona. On this episode of Squawk Ident, I have the opportunity to speak with a young aviator whose journey intersected with mine early on in the progression of advancements in our respective careers. His path directed him to the left, while mine went right. Here we are over a decade later. He is flying for a U.S. legacy carrier we refer to as Acme Airlines on the show, and I at a U.S. legacy carrier we call Legacy Airlines. We as aviators often find ourselves saying things like, you never know where you're going to end up in this profession. It's a little bit luck, a little bit of chance, and a whole lot of timing. This statement cannot be better represented than the tales from the journey we are about to dive into on this episode of Squawk Ident. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Right after a brief word from our sponsors. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the show. Well, what an exciting past few episodes. I've got to admit, it has been just a honor to be able to sit down with uh, some of these wonderful aviators here in the past few weeks and bring to you some of the highlights of their journeys. And, you know, what a humbling experience to be able to talk to these people. Uh, between uh, the Colonel Terry Schooler's interview uh, and his progression in the military and you know all of his strategic moves in his career progression, he really does have a very bright future ahead of him. And I want to just again say thank you to him uh, for sitting down with us and you know giving us a little bit of an insight to what his journey has involved so far. Also, this last episode, episode 28, I believe, just amazing. I could have kept talking with Captain Ash for another few days easily. I mean, flying together and hearing his stories uh, was an absolute treat. It was almost like having just a slight piece of history sitting alongside me, flying along uh, during our sequence. And, you know, I really hope that our paths will cross again because I really look forward to hearing more about all of the amazing moves that he's made in his aviation career so far. But today is another wonderful treat for me. Uh, I met this next individual early on in my career progression. And uh, as I mentioned in the onset of the introduction to the show, you know, we were able to worked together for a short period of time, and then our paths just kind of went in opposite directions. Uh, But we've kept up over the years. I consider him a dear friend, and he was on an overnight recently, and I was on an overnight as well. 
and we were able to connect through the power of the internet. Thankfully, we had some pretty decent Wi-Fi at the hotel, so it seemed to be pretty, uh, pretty good, worked out pretty good with the sound quality and the audio. So without further ado, let's get right into the audio from that interview. And ladies and gentlemen, my next guest is a dear friend. He studied architecture and aerospace engineering at Mississippi State. He found a job at the local FBO near his school, and, well, I guess that's where the trouble all began. He uh, ended up uh, leaving Mississippi State to return back home to Tupelo, Mississippi, where he found a job working at an FBO and later the Airport Authority of Tupelo Regional Airport. A few flight lessons here and there, and his career progression changed. He then started to attend Delta State University of Mississippi, where he did studies in commercial aviation. He earned his CFI and I at Delta State, where he taught flight lessons to the young, impressionable pilots out there, and he kept putting his application out, as we all do at that point in our careers, and he found a job at an airline that here at Squawk Ident we refer to as Sandpiper Regional. That's where we first met, day one of indoctrination. And uh, it was a very interesting class. It was a large class at the time. Uh, one of the largest classes that Sandpiper had since 9-11. And I had the distinct privilege in meeting this individual. We were both selected to fly the Embraer 145. He was there for a little bit over a year when he found a job opportunity that achieved a direct ATP PIC rating for the airline day one as he walked in the door. He started working for Compass Airlines where he flew the Embraer 175. After six short years and a rare flow-through agreement to an airline that we will call Acme, he landed himself in the right seat of an MD-88. Just two years later, he found position to change over to the Airbus A320 family of aircraft. Please help me in welcoming to the show, Mr. Matt Phillips. Matt, hello. How are you? Hey, doing well. Thanks for having me on. Oh, my pleasure. And hey, it's great, great to see you over here. We're uh, doing a nice little FaceTime call while I'm here. I just landed on day one of my current sequence. Uh, just landed in Phoenix, Arizona, grabbed a bite to eat with my captain, went over to a, a cool place by our hotel that we've spoken about in past episodes called the Cornish Pasties. Uh, grabbed a couple beers and a Cornish pasty and uh, Got a full day of flying behind me. Got some food in my belly. Got a couple brewskis uh, ready to go. And now here we are uh, setting up our accoutrement of, of podcasting uh, equipment here. And uh, yeah, we're on a, a FaceTime call and recording all this wonderful audio for you today. Uh, Matt, where are you? Let's let us uh, in on what your overnight uh, entailed and how your flight schedule was today. Let's see. Right now we are in uh, downtown Sioux Falls, South Dakota, uh, and it's a thirty, I don't know, thirty-two hour overnight. So we got in uh, yesterday, uh, ten o'clock or so, and I think we go out tomorrow morning, like seven, eight in the morning or so. Yeah. So nice day to relax, enjoy the balmy twenty degree weather. Back in the day when we were at uh, Sandpiper Regional, we used to call that the lost weekend where you lost an entire day. But oh. the, difference is, <laughs> the difference is at Sandpiper, we didn't have minimum days and duty regs. Do you have those wonderful uh, contract uh, goodies at your uh, airline there at Acme? Uh, we don't have the duty regs, but we have the, the minimum trip credit. So. so you have a trip credit? Yeah. So whatever the, the value of the trip, no matter what happens, you're going to get paid. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So, and 30 hours in, uh, in Sioux Falls, did you venture out and see the falls at all? Uh, I didn't. My captain did. And so some of them are, uh, some of them are frozen. Some are still running. I'm, I'm rather uh, averse to temperatures below 60 degrees. So 
Yeah. I don't, <laughs> don't necessarily get out as much. Oh, you but, sound uh, like a Southern yeah, California same thing. guy. Went out for uh, <laughs> went out for dinner earlier. You know. Yeah. Went to a pub down the street. Yeah, and uh, so you found a, yourself a good watering hole. Now tell me, I've been there many, many mm-hmm. times at my regional carrier that uh, I flew for for many, many years, so a little over a decade there. And I've been there during the, what they call the seasonal slaughter. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. So I, I, it was years and years ago when I was there last. It was somewhere around this time of year, and the smell coming off of the van right when we got to the hotel was just terrible. And we, we asked the driver, what the heck is this smell? It sounds like it's terrible. It smells like death. And he goes, oh, yeah, that's the uh, pig, pig uh, meat plant over there. They're doing the slaughter tonight, and you can, you can smell it throughout the entire neighborhood, especially when the winds blow from the north. And It's funny you say that because I've come here before. I've only been here a handful of times. But I've come here before, and same thing. You get off the plane, you go to the, the van of the hotel, and you're like, what is that? Is there a paper mill next? next door what what's going on so uh yeah we couldn't figure out what it was the captain thought it was just the hotel or the air conditioning uh, yeah it's when they slaughter i've been here that time because i've had unfortunately had that smell as well (laughs) yeah it's it's pretty bad and and very memorable absolutely to say the least but the reason i asked you on today uh was because you've had a, a very interesting journey in your career progression in aviation and you know that's what we do here at squawk ident we talk to aviators around the globe, and we talk about their journeys and how unique they are and how wonderful they can be and how uh, difficult sometimes the journeys can be. And, you know, I just wanted to, to thank you for coming on the show and talk to you a little bit about yours. So you started out really right out of high school. You know, you decided, I'm going to go study architecture. And, yeah. you know, what, what happened there? How did that initial reaction to go study architecture and then later, you know, progressing into aerospace engineering, how did that turn into flight training? Yeah. Um, the real short answer is like, even having done it, I'm not really sure, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I was always one of those kids, you know, from a young age that had interest in airplanes. Um, but got glasses in the second grade. So I'm like, yeah, it's probably never really going to happen, but you know, someday I at least want to be want to be a pilot you know i just want to be able to fly an airplane um you know so i always had those thoughts you know throughout the years had some airplane rides um but i was always you know creative and artistic uh you know and had some art classes in high school and the uh teacher said yeah you gotta you know if you, you know thought about what you're going to do you know where you want to go to college and i'm like well i'm not really sure it's like well you know um you know i've had some students that have you know gone into architecture school and you know you seem like you're pretty technical you know, as well as being kind of artistic, you know, have you ever thought about that? So, well, not really. Um, and so that's kind of where the, uh, the architecture bug started because I'd always liked building things, you know, like any kid that likes to play with Legos or bricks or anything. Um, so, uh, you know, towards my senior year, I submitted a portfolio uh, to Mississippi State. You had to turn in a big, you know, art portfolio and I think there's an essay to go with it and some other things, but they reviewed all that and they only took about uh, 30 people or so a semester uh, were accepted in the architecture program. And I was one of the ones I submitted my portfolio and they accepted me. So I'm like, well, hey, you know, if it's kind of a little exclusive and I submit and they think I'm good enough for that, then yeah, maybe that's what I need to do. So I was really excited. Um, you know, first part of college got in, all, you know, all excited first part of school and it was absolutely nothing like you would think it would be because you think architecture, designing buildings and you're, you know, structures and things. And that's more what an engineer does. And not even more what an engineer does. It is what an engineer does. The architecture side is like a big art course. So they'll come and say, oh, you know, we want you to make, you know, we want you to make a, a, a red box and it has to be a box and it has to be red and we don't accept anything else. Everybody comes in with red boxes of different sizes and one person comes in with a blue ball. You know, because what is color? Color is a reflection of light, and yada, yada, yada. And so the guy that made the ball that's not even a box that was the wrong color gets an A, and everybody else has C's or D's because they just kind of fit within the little mold. And when you're in architecture school, you know, you're not confound by the bounds of society, and you can 
explore and you know now's the time to be creative because when you get to the real world everybody just wants a square building and yada yada so anyway so architecture was not what i was cut out to do so um didn't really care for that at all and i had um i was in a fraternity had some had two actually fraternity brothers that were in aerospace engineering and you know every now and then i was hanging out with them or hearing about projects they were working on you know hang out with him sometimes like hey you know i've got this thing and you know we're going in the wind tunnel uh, we've got really we have a wind tunnel he's like yeah actually we've got se several we've got like three supersonic and one uh you know one subsonic wind tunnel I'm like, wow. really i'd like to see this mississippi so state and, going you know, on <laughs> yeah so i mean this is like you know really like you know for an airplane nerd this is really like ah, now you got my attention i'm like well this is so cool so i'm like no nope, this is what i'm going to do now so i dropped aerospace engineering uh, or drop architecture rather, and you know, change my major to aerospace engineering. Initially, only like twelve hours of credit transferred, so you know, like your English and things like that transfer. But you know, there's not really much with architecture that relates to aerospace engineering. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so in essence, I was kind of starting over. So that set me back a little bit. Um, but you know, I'm taking these classes and like, oh, you're going to have to, you know, calculate the long range specific fuel consumption of this jet, and you know, figure out these efficiencies and aerodynamics, and you know all this stuff. And it was really interesting. Um, but man was some of the math over my head. So I think I made it through Cal one, two and three statics dynamics. Um, I really struggled with linear and that, that really never set in. And so I was doing, doing fairly well in in my core classes. Um, but I wasn't excelling as I should, like it was readily apparent that, uh, if I got this degree, you know, I'm not, you know, making 3.8 and 4.0s, you know, I'm just barely passing by. Like, I'm getting by, but barely getting by. And I was actually, absolutely, you know, busting it to get that done. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, what? Like, I just, like, okay, so I was just kind of getting by. Well, as it, all this was happening, uh, one of my other fraternity brothers worked at FBO at the local airport. Um, so being a poor college kid looking for a job, like, hey, I can, you know, and so you know, working at a restaurant or something, I can go fuel airplanes and hang around airplanes all day. So he got me a job out there. So that was my first aviation job was just working at the local FBO. Um, so kind of typical, you know, sit around a little airport out in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, every now and then a jet would roll up, but, you know, it was just smaller piston planes. There was some regional uh, service into that airport. Uh, I think Comair came in a few times from Atlanta. Uh, and I want to say, I think Masaba came in on a sob once a day. Um, anyway, so I got to fuel them. So I had a little airline interaction there, but never threw bags or anything like that. Uh, and then during the summers, uh, instead of working at uh, Golden Triangle, the local airport, I worked at my home airport. I got a job there during the summer working at the FBO there. And so as I was, you know, on and off, on and off, back and forth between school and home in the summers. Uh, one of the linemen I was working with in Tupelo, you know, we we're discussing school and so forth. And he's like, oh, I just did a semester at Delta State. You know, I'm going to, you know, aviation there. So it's like, hey, if you, you know, if you're not really, you know, obviously you love airplanes and everything. We've had a few lessons. If you're not, uh, if you don't think you're doing so hot aerospace engineering, why don't you just fly airplanes? Like, don't build them, just fly them. It's like, yeah, you can go to Delta State. It's great. And, he, you know told me all about it. And at that point, it's like, well, I've kind of spun my wheels enough in aerospace engineering. It's like, yeah, I'm going to do that. So I just kind of picked up, dropped out of one school, enrolled in another school, you know, all the basic credits and everything transferred over. And this is kind of the, the second attempt <laughs> at a career. And uh, I got to Delta State and it wasn't that anything was easier, but it just didn't seem like I was really having a trial that hard. It's like now all this, you know, studying, cramming and trying to learn things. Like it just, not that it necessarily just came to me. I was still studying, but I enjoyed it so much that it, it just kind of made it easy. Yeah. It more fit your personality, I think. Exactly. And yeah. I was like, oh, I've got to go out to the airport today and fly an airplane. I'll twist my arm, you know. Right. It's like, oh, you got to learn about what lessons tomorrow. So what airplanes were uh, you uh, primarily doing your flight instruction on? Uh, primarily 172s. So we had, uh, I think, five 152s, and our uh, flight team used those a lot. And mostly 
uh, 172s for the primary training. Commercial, we had some 172 RGs, mm -hmm. and we had a 206 for your uh, high performance stuff. Yeah, yeah. Primarily the uh, with NAV two package, I believe, was back then uh, the six pack with the uh, two VOR receivers. Yep. And so there are mostly, I think, 70 and 80 models. Mm -hmm. So I think there were 172 M's. And then I think that was M. I can't really remember. And then shortly after I got there, I guess we got a grant and got uh, five uh, brand new R models. Oh, so they yeah. had uh, the, uh, what was it, a KLN 94? I don't really remember the GPS, but it was a GPS equipped. The other ones yeah, were just so the monochrome know, screen, and ADM. Uh, GPS. Or was yeah. it the full color? Yeah, it was the monochrome one, KLN one. Uh, it was the color one, yeah. Oh, yeah, the color, the Garmin 430, 530, something like that? No, it wasn't a Garmin. It was, it a, was a KLN. Um, yeah, it was a Bendix King. I just don't remember the don't remember the number on it. Yeah. But but yeah, that was a ever ever present argument. It's like, oh, where do you fly today? Oh, well, you're out in one of the old ones. It's like, oh, I want to fly one of the new ones. <laughs> yeah. you know? So we were lucky though. We got to take our check rides in the R model and they did not have ADFs. So on your instrument check ride, you didn't have to fly an ADF. Nah, <laughs> cheater. <So. laughs> Actually, that's <yeah>, pretty smart. <laughs> so but we had those in multi engine. We had um, duchesses, Dutch Eye. Yeah, the Duchess. Yeah, had the, the Beach the, Duchess. The Beach so. Duchess. Yeah, yeah, just kind of uh, more robust fuselage. Yeah, yeah. So we had several of those, and those were actually pretty good flying airplanes. I enjoyed flying them. Okay, so you you were uh, doing your flight training at Delta State, and mm -hmm. uh, how long did that flight training go? Was it uh, two years of uh, studies and flight training, or was it longer? Yeah, I think it was about two, two and a half, because it was, uh, like I said, most of the non-aviation college stuff, uh, you know, English and physics and, you know, that kind of stuff was out of the way. So uh, basically it was just the ground portion of uh, flight school, mm -hmm. you know, and all your written and then the, uh, and the flying. So, you know, private instrument, commercial, uh, single eye, double eye. Yeah. And what was so, the most then, challenging part of that? I mean, a lot of people... You know, everybody has their their hurdles to to kind of overcome in general aviation and in general mm -hmm. aviation instruction, and and usually, I mean, as an instructor and, and yourself as an instructor, you probably saw this. Most people kind of tend to get hung up around the same areas of study. Were there any yeah. areas in your study that kind of gave you a little bit um, of pause that you had to kind of go back and just refocus on? Um, if anything, it was probably when I was, uh, getting my single eye. So just your basic CFI. Cause everyone says that like, oh, you go just take the, uh, you know, take the FOI and it's easy and you get it out of the way. And then like you really hunker down and, you know, work towards your FIA and get that written out of the way. Uh, and for me, it was just the opposite. The FIA was, I think I almost made a hundred on that test and the FOI, like I really struggled. I passed it the first time. Um, you know anything? What do they? What's the saying? Anything more than passing is just showing off. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, exactly. I didn't show off very much. No. <laughs> but well, uh, and just to be yeah. clear, what is uh, FOI and uh... Uh, FOI is uh, fundamentals of instruction, mm -hmm. and FI is flight instructor airplane. So those are the formal the, names of the two tests. Yeah, the books to, that uh, we used to, to study to religiously prior to taking any written or oral test. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> very yes. much. And and uh, it's um, to my understanding now, and I have not been in the general aviation uh, realm for many years. Um, I do have some uh, friends and uh, coworkers that are continuously uh, doing flight instruction, CFI work. Um, but for, it's my understanding that nowadays they don't focus so much on what we used to call the PTS or the practical test standards. And, mm. you know, learning the kind of rote memorization of answers, you know, here's the 300 question bank. Uh, any of these questions are fair game, be able to answer yeah. it, mo at least then most of them uh, with, you know, 100% comprehension. Now it's more um, scenario based, more, let's see if you get the big picture. It's not really important yeah. if, you, if you have the PTS down, let's see that you can think. Um, exactly. Would you say yeah. that that's pretty accurate to how you went through and how it is maybe now today? Yeah, well, today I'm not really sure. Because um, nothing we had back then was glass. So I don't, 
for example, when you're with a student, you know, you tell them, you know, duck your hood, duck your head, you know, we're going to fly around for, you know, 15, 20, 30 minutes. And uh, then we'll get you to look up. You need to take me back to the airport, you know, and they have to just look up like, oh, I got lost. Where am I? Figure out where you are. Break out the sectional, which, you know, I don't think people carry paper sectionals anymore either. Um, I'm thinking like, you know, like a G1000 glass equipped airplane. How do you get someone lost? Right. Like, how do you teach people? How do you like, oh, you're not looking outside enough. Let me cover up the entire dash. It's called you know, the master switch. Outside. And I know people that, that are that cunning. Oh, that, they, they, they put the off, master yeah. switch and they put oh. a post-it on it going, you just lost electrical power to all your avionics. Congratulations. Now find, yeah. <laughs> find the way back to the airport. Yeah. So, I mean, there are, there are definitely ways. But yes, you're right. We, you know, I was still kind of instructing when the G1000 was brand new and, and you know, our, our school's DE was uh, talking about how the FA was considering making an add-on rating for uh, either glass cockpit or uh, what we refer to as steam gauges, because yeah. if you're rated as an instrument pilot, now you can get in any IFR-equipped aircraft and go fly the GA IFR-equipped airplane, but yeah. if your instruction was completely glass cockpit G1000 or, or newer, and now you're in grandpa's, you know, hold 172 with a NAV2 package at a six pack. And here, go fly IFR. You're legal, but yeah. definitely, how's your scan? Are you safe? Uh, yeah, probably pro not. So they were, they were contemplating years ago. I mean, we're talking almost a decade ago. They were contemplating having some kind of add on that would be required that you have to demonstrate proficiency in both. Uh, the anal analog gauges and digital displays uh, in order to be able to fly both aircraft. I have not heard anything of it. I've been out of the loop for a while, but from what I understand, that's no, that's not a requirement at this point. No. So, and you know, I'm not really sure what exactly what people are exposed to nowadays. You know, I know less and less people I think are going for ratings every year. So yeah, you know, the, the percentage, I think I've had to guess it probably skews more towards, well, I'm getting my private in order to get my instrument to get commercial to go down some sort of professional route, mm -hmm. uh, more so than like, oh, you know, I've always wanted to fly, so I just want to get my pilot's license, or oh, I want to buy an airplane. Um, so I'm, I'm not really sure what the mix of that is. Yeah. And how long did you uh, flight instruct for? Um, I think I got my CFI. Um, so that would have been what six months or so before I got my double I. I mm -hmm. think it took me, and so I got my CFI just before graduation. Uh, and or my double I just before graduation. So I'd been instructing, I think for about six or eight months. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I instructed for another year and a half, two years, I think yeah. uh, after graduation at the university. Always at Delta state. Yeah. So how did that uh, progress from there? What, how did, uh, did you just send out applications and resumes and whatnot? Uh, yep. Trying to get the time up at the time. It was, you know, if you didn't have a thousand hours total time, no one wanted to look at you. Um, and if you didn't have a, you know, a decent amount of multi-time. No one wanted to really look at you either. So that was before the bottom had kind of dropped out uh, as far as hours and requirements and things. And of course, this was long before the, uh, uh, I guess the fifteen hundred hour rule, yeah. as they call it, and one seventeen. So. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, it was just you know, fly everything you can get your hands on, get as many students as you can, build as much time as you can, and uh, you know, keep updating the resume and put your stuff out there. And so. I don't remember exactly which airlines I had applied to, but you know, it was four or five different airlines. It wasn't absolutely every regional, but uh, it was kind of all the big names at the time. Mm -hmm. And how did you how did you select the Sandpiper Regional Airport or airline? That uh, you went to? <laughs> Sadly, they were the first ones. They were actually not my first choice. They were the first ones that contacted me. It's like, hey, we'd like to do an interview. So, like, okay, great. Um, so you know, I'm over the moon. Hey, this is finally happening. And, you know, I know they, uh, you know, flew me out to their, uh, headquarters. You had to have, you know, all these different documents and everything in order. And we need, you know, your logbook marked to these certain pages, you know, and all these different things. Uh, and it was, it was a tough interview too. I mean, I think actually that interview was probably one of the hardest in my career. First, so because it was my first interview, so obviously anything that, you know, if you haven't experienced it yet, you know, there's that whole fear of the unknown. Uh, but even they, I mean, it was, I mean, you knew what it was like. It was a two-day interview. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. you know. So it was like the full review. When they say they're going to review your logbook, you you know, you go in and sit with the guy, the one guy in the little room, and he's flipping through your logbook. He's asking about individual flights and, hey, why is this log this PIC in this airplane, but this other one isn't? I'm like, well, I mean, I was the only person in the front of the airplane that day. And the other days, you know, there was a, another guy in the other seat and he was flying it. And I was just kind of running the radio. So I didn't really feel that was PIC. But the other times I was like, oh, this is a good idea. I mean, he really picked through it, mm-hmm. you know, and that was just that guy. Then there's the HR portion, you know, and then there's the tell me about the time. You know, everybody gets those questions. So and then you get through all that and everything and they invite you back the second day and then you get to do the whole astronaut physical. That was the most uh, intimidating for me. I remember, you know, we were at the uh, Legacy Airlines headquarters, which was shared by Sandpiper Regional. And here we were (laughs) with the big boys going in, and we had the nurse and the doctors, and that's when they did the FBI uh, fingerprinting and background checks and all that stuff. And here's a vial, you know, I'm going to follow you and watch you, uh, you know, pull out your your uh, manhood yeah. and you know go into this vial because we're going to do drug FAA drug test and DOT drug test and we're going to do a hair follicle sample and and then the yeah. doctor turns around and she's got a finger like ET and you're thinking oh <laughs> yeah. my god yep. <laughs> are you yep. freaking it was serious the, uh, right now thing. yep and you know everything so it works yeah. and uh, you're like Jesus I feel like an astronaut here you know yeah like and that. especially with you know like I said I had you know got glasses in the second grade so that kind of eliminated any chance I had of, you know, flying anything in the military. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that was the biggest component, you know, for being a pilot, you know, because, you know, I guess historically or whatever, everybody's like, oh, pilots, you know, you have to have perfect vision. You have to have all this and that. I'm like, well, I wear glasses. I've got glasses. I can't get to the other side of the room. So especially when you're in your, you know, it's one thing going for your medical and it's like, okay, I've had a first class for years. I know I can hold it. But, you know, then, you know, when you're in with a, you know, prospective employer, yeah, you well, know, what are they going to find? Worked all this, and then they're starting to, you know, poke at you know, not poke at your eyes, but they're starting to, you know, you're having to read the chart and do all the eye tests. Like, man, if I'm going to bust, this is where I'm going to bust. And so, yeah, the uh, the nerves are pretty high. Yeah, yeah. And and how was your uh, your simulator portion of the interview? Uh, the simulator was good. I think I was. Um, what were we in? Were you I in the think Foker? We're in a, was it ATR? Maybe I was in the Foker. Oh, I definitely wasn't in that one. I was in, I think I was in an ATR. Were you? And, and honestly, I don't remember too much about it because I think it went went pretty well. Yeah. They just wanted to see if you could fly a glass uh, screen uh, PFD with, uh, did you have the crosshairs on the ATR? Um, I, I on, never flew it. Honestly, I, I, I don't remember. Yeah. I think I can remember my second interview, you know, for a future airline. I remember their interview and their sim. Um, I really don't remember the Sandpiper sim. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of that, they were like, oh, congratulations. Can you start on Thursday for me? What What did they tell you? Oh, I don't remember. I think I had to wait for a letter, a letter or a call. It wasn't immediate. It was like, okay, yeah, conditional, but we'll call it you kind of thing. Yeah. So I can remember my first day, uh, you know, we're in a room. They had to find chairs from other classrooms because there were so many of, they weren't, they weren't ready for so many new hires Yeah, in, in one class. And they were very impressed and instructors from all over the building were coming over. This is at a time when Sandpiper and Legacy Airlines shared the training uh, center for, at least for the ground school portion and the simulator events. And, um, and yeah, people were coming from all over to, to take a look at this big class, you know, and, yeah. And here we were and coffee in the back of the room and we all had to stand up and everybody say, you know, state your name and tell us what you did before this and, you know, and why you, why you're here. And, uh, you know, we all went through the room and I, and I've said it before in the show, you know, then instructor stood up there on day one and said, all right, look to your left, look to your right. Odds are one of you or if not both of you, or if not all three of you aren't going to make it. You better start yeah. studying. Study at night. Don't don't slack off and go drink beers. You know you need to study. And at all we we all kind of <laughs> were intimidated. I remember. Do you remember that uh, that day? Oh yeah, very much. It was um, and that was um, like I don't know what like what your legacy training was like, but uh, back then we had it was like the the old school traditional full. You go through the end doc and you go through like two three weeks of ground school. You know, and then your check ride is a full on check ride. You're sitting yeah. with the instructor or the examiner for, you know, what, two, almost three hours, you know, and you've got another two or so hours in the sim. And it was long orals, long check rides. Yeah. They, uh, they would grill you for, uh, hours for your oral. 
Uh, it was very intimidating. Yeah. It was basically see if you can handle the pressure. I think. Yeah. How do you how do you handle yourself under pressure? I think really that was the the meter more so than the knowledge. I mean, the knowledge obviously you had to to pass the knowledge and and but it was really catered towards let's put some pressure on you and let's see if you just keep moving forward. Uh, you know, you you screw up in the sim because of some pressure or some you know fine. Do you keep flying the airplane or do you give up? Yeah, and that's really what I think. I remember what that was they were looking for. Yeah, I remember too. That was also part of the pressure. That was this three strike rule. So like, hey, first uh, first big mistake. Yeah, we make mistakes, but that's your first strike. Second big mistake. So like, all right, we need to sit down and talk. Right. Like, well, here's how this can go going forwards. Like, you can have a third strike, but you know, that's that's kind of bad if if you get the third strike because then you know then we're not not gonna be able to let you work here. Right. Um. So then it came to like, okay, now it's on you. It's a tough decision. Do I try to leave and leave amicably or do I like, I'm struggling? Do I, you know, tough it out, you know, and, right. and you know, and hope I make it. So luckily I didn't have any strikes going through. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. So, we got but, very lucky. But, but, but you always felt like you were about to, you know. Yeah. You know, then the end of it, you're sweating, you're on the brink of, you know, you're shaking, you're sweating, you're like, oh, I got to do well. I can't mess this up. This is my career here. And then at the end they go, yeah, oh no, exactly. you did great. I don't know what you're talking about. You did great. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like yeah, all right. Six hours, I'm sweating. I lost ten pounds of sweat. And you're like, oh yeah, you did great. Exactly. Yeah, right. Yeah. So this was this was the experience you had at Sandpiper, and and you know your yep. story is absolutely not unique in any way, shape, or form. This is this is the yep. way it was in a post and 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 I dare say even pre nine eleven atmosphere at a regional one twenty one carrier when you came in with a commercial rating and you know you you. You worked your way up and did your time in the cockpit and flew with some very senior captains, some old school captains that were around very. way before CRM and, and TEM and all this, you know, and we are, we're all a team building, you know, that these guys were like the, when they were FOs and when we got hired, the captains we flew with when they were FOs, it was like, okay, only want to hear three things from you clear on the right. <laughs> I want to hear, you know, the checklist items and I want to hear the beers are on me, captain. That's it. And, yeah. you know, it, if you're lucky, I might let you land one or two. Yeah. <laughs> that that I, was the I, attitude. I, yeah. Most of the guys I flew with there were, were pretty good. I remember there was one in particular. I mean, first day, beginning of the first leg, he's given a brief. And I almost thought he was joking at first, but he wasn't. He looks at the overhead and runs his hand down between two of the panels. He's like, your flows are generally over here, right? I'm like, yeah, I mean, all my flows, that's where the bleeds. Yeah, that's where my flows are. He's like, good. You just stay on this side of this line. All these other switches, these are mine. Don't, don't, don't mess with those. <laughs> yeah, and, I was, and, I, and, I, and I kind of laughed a little bit, like, oh, okay. And yeah. he just looked at me. I'm like, oh, wow, he's you're like, being serious. He's like looking at you going, I'm not effing kidding, boy. <laughs> no, <laughs> not at all. So luckily everyone wasn't like that. But yeah, there's, yeah. there's always a few in front. So, you know, you were there not very long uh, at the no, Sandpiper. No, it was only, only about a year and a half, maybe. So um, Yeah, and then uh, you moved I mean, on to uh, a place that offered you a PIC ATP from day one. Tell me how that, yeah. how did you first find that position? And then secondly, what made you decide, hey, I'm going to leave here and I'm going to go there? What, what yeah, kind of sparked um, that? I was, I mean, obviously for, uh, for Sam Piper, I was excited, you know, it's a great opportunity. It was a building block. I would not be where I am without that experience. Um, but getting there, you know, there was a lot of, you know, a lot of those people were, you know, flow downs from Acme because it was a furlough. And so now you're flying at Sam Piper. Um, you know, so there's a lot of people that had, you know, had, you know, worked hard in their career. And then after 9-11, you get knocked back and everybody set back and it was just very stagnant. Mm -hmm. um, and there was just, you know, some unhappiness and some stagnation. And I was looking at it, it's like, wow, it's like, you know, all these people, you know, they're all ahead of me and they've been knocked back. Some of them, you know, like they, you know, from captain back to FO and they're just, you know, they're there for a long time and everybody was constantly waiting. Well, when are things going to get better? When are things going to move up? You know, I think the upgrade was, it was eight to nine year upgrade. And then the following year, it's still eight to nine year upgrade. It was just kind of a perpetual eight to nine year upgrade because no one really knew what was going to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, so I always kind of had my eyes elsewhere and I was hearing of, you know, other friends getting on with other, 
other regionals and things. Um, you know, at this point, around this time, um, you know, a lot of other airlines had gone under. I think uh, Champion was on its way out or had gone under. Uh, ATA was on its way out. Midwest was on the way out. Um, you know, so a lot of these smaller carriers, you know, were just really struggling. Um, you know, some all the airlines at that point were kind of struggling. So it's like, wow, how is this really going to play out? Through the Northwest uh, bankruptcy, you know, they were ordered like, hey, you know, as part of your restructuring, you're going to have to offload a certain amount of flying to a regional. You know, you're just going to have to do that, you know, cost structure wise. That's what you're going to have to do. So they negotiated, uh, you know, their union negotiated this deal to where like, okay, if you're going to buy these regional jets, you know, we want our furlough guys to fly them. We don't want, you know, to have to give this flying to somebody else. And then we've got our guys furloughed on the street watching these other guys basically operate a B-scale airline. Um, so that's what they agreed to. And that's how Compass Airlines was formed. You know, they got this operating certificate from a defunct airline, use that to keep one plane flying. And this turned it into this airline. Well, kind of when uh, everything kind of came to fruition, I think only three of the furloughed pilots actually took positions. Well, now they've got this company starting up and these aircraft on orders and deliveries. And it's like, well, we're going to have to hire people then. Um, you know, so they started hiring. And, you know, when an airline first starts, it's one of the first, you know, unique, rare times to where, you know, the, the growth is not necessarily organic, but the growth is just, you know, necessary. Like if you get on early there, yeah, you know, you're going, especially if you're the initial cadre of pilots, you know, you're initially, you, know, you start off as a captain, you know, so everything, you know, it's just gravy from there. Um, so, and they were, you know, I'm from North Mississippi. And so they, you know, had a base in Memphis. So I'm like, well, well, there's, I could live in base. Um, you know, I could potentially be a captain pretty early on. Um, you know, and then, you know, worst case scenarios, like, well, if that doesn't work out, at least I've done something very early on in my career before I've built any seniority before I've, you know, gotten comfortable, you know, with the schedule before I've really got, you know, reliant on a little bit more, you know, steady, you know, better income, you know, so if I'm going to try something, I need to try it when I'm at the bottom. So it's like, you know what, I'm going to give it a shot. Yeah. You know, and people, you know, and people, you know, hindsight's 2020, it was, you know, I couldn't have made a luckier decision. Um, but, you know, at the time, I was like, I don't know if this is right. You know, I just got this job. I've only been here a year. You know, like, have I really given enough effort? You know, are things about to turn around? You know, so it was, you know, it wasn't an easy decision to make. Um, but like I said, it's like, well, if I'm going to do something, I need to do it now. Yeah. So, yeah, well, the timing in your career was, years, you know, 10, 15 years in. Yeah. The timing in your career was definitely uh, uh, good. I mean, it was the right time. You, you've only been at Sandpiper Regional for a short period of time. And, you know, here they were offering uh, basically a, a, a new company that was growing that was going to be giving you uh, potential to be in the left seat relatively quickly. As a matter of fact, they were so confident in that fact that after you got hired, I mean, the stipulation was you were going to get an ATP PSC type rating, not some SIC or commercial rating. And again, before. Uh, the ATP requirement for first officers. So you you were really ahead of the regulation. Um, and you yeah. went to a place, and it was risky, and I remember you and I talked about it. Uh, we had conversations over many a few beers uh, at the hotel talking about, all right, uh, is this really a good choice? I don't know, but, I mean, if I, got, if I don't do it now, when am I going to do it after I grow roots? I never... I never forgot that you said that, you know, you're like, oh, yeah. so you, you, you made the, the risky, I thought it was a risky choice at the time. Um, yeah, I did too. <laughs> and I hope, I hope you understand. I, I fully supported you for it um, oh, absolutely. because it was something that was very impressive because even though you were only there a year, I mean, I, you, you talked to me about it. You were trying to get me to come over there too. And here yeah. I was, you know, as a, uh, single income earner at the time with a small child at home. And, and, uh, I just couldn't make that financial jump. And, uh, although I, you know, you and I had the same exact seniority, uh, yeah. at Sandpiper, but you made the jump and wow, it really turned out, uh, very lucrative for you. 
Oh yeah. It how was, long um, did it take before definitely you Definitely best, best case scenario. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you went through your training. Okay. Obviously. And, uh, yeah. I remember you were coming back to the, uh, the offices to, to get some, uh, SIM time documentation because you were then going to upgrade. They, they told you, okay, we got a position for you, but yeah. you needed to prove that you had a few, just a few more hours. Didn't you? You remember that? Yeah, I forgot. Yeah, I don't remember the exact requirements at the time, but it was it was that close to where when your number came up for upgrade, like they were, you know, for a lot of people, like they're looking at your logbooks, looking at your time. And there were some people that like, well, you can upgrade when you get the time. So, I mean, some people were only, you know, 10, 15 hours short. So it's like, okay, we're going to have to push it back by a week. Fly this next trip, you'll have enough, you know, enough time yeah. as to... Uh, and I don't remember exactly what the requirements are. Well, the ATP requirements. Yeah, I think um, twenty five hundred hours minimum. I don't know if that's more of an insurance thing than ATP, but to be a yeah, PIC exactly. in the left seat at a one twenty one carrier. Yeah, whatever yeah. the minimum was which, at the time. Yeah, which all our training, uh, all our initial initial new hire training was all done in the left seat, and so you were left seat type, uh, and then just had to have the you know the whatever it was the approach and whatever. Yeah. You know, check out in the right seat. But it was the full left seat type captain's ride. And you, if you didn't have your ATP, you got it. Um, you know, and you had the full type rating from the get go. Mm -hmm. uh, so when your when your number came up to upgrade, because we were steadily gaining, you know, two three airplanes a month. Um, so they were hiring as fast as they could hire. You know, to get enough people in there to staff those aircraft. When your number came up, they looked. All right, do you have the time? Okay, great. You got the time. Congratulations. Here's your upgrade. This next trip you've got, uh, we're going to take it off your schedule, and you're going to fly this trip with this check airman. So you'll finish one trip as a first officer, and you know two three days off. And next trip you show up, and there's a check airman standing there, and he's like, "All right, let's you know let's get going." And you <laughs> go in the cockpit and pause and look, and like, "Wait a second, I can't go that way. I got to go this way." And you sit in the left seat, and he sits in the right seat, and you know you do your. Uh, Initial operating experience, and at yeah. the end of it, and they're like, "Okay, great." And FA sits in the jump seat, and you fly a leg, and they sign you off. And it's like, "Congratulations!" Yeah, you know, Captain Phillips. <laughs> like, then, I, then I had my two days off and started reserve. That's it. <laughs> Start reserve, and now so, you're flying with a new hire, going, "Oh, Captain." <laughs> yeah. So there's no, you know, so it's definitely that's another very fortunate, very unique experience to where it wasn't, you know, you had these years of of working towards something and, you know, gaining seniority, you know, and gathering all this experience. And then you go and go through training again, you know, whether some of that's captain specific or not, but, mm -hmm. you know, you do the full course, you know, from the left seat, from the ground up. Uh, this wasn't that, this was one trip to the next trip, Yeah, you know, so, so it was, it was very much, you know, out of the frying pan into the fire. So it, it got everybody's attention, but yeah. luckily, um, because of the circumstances around the way the company was formed, like I said, a lot of these other airlines, you know, had got under and some people just, I hate, you know, I've got a family to feed. I just need to have currency. You know, I got to have a job. So there's plenty of times, you know, your FO would get on the plane. It's like, Oh yeah. Hey, look, I'm pretty new at this. I haven't consolidated yet. You know, um, you know, so just, you know, back me up and watch me like, what's your background? It's like, Oh yeah. I used to fly L 10 11s. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, so it's like, Oh, okay. So there's more experience in the right seat. So, yeah. Um, so the airline was good in that aspect is that even though it was a regional and everybody was new, there was a, a good balance of experience there, uh, you know, and everybody kind of knew the gig and why everybody was there and what everybody was going through. So uh, uh, it was a really good air. The, the people at that airline were really great. They really backed each other up and, uh, you know, everybody helped each other out. Yeah. I remember one time, I think it was 2000 and uh, dare I say 15 or 2014. Uh, you and I, uh, I knew you were, uh, doing an overnight in the big apple in New York oh, city. Yeah. I remember and, that. We got I pictures was, from that. Yeah. yeah. I was based there, uh, at the time I was a new captain for Sandpiper regional based, uh, joint uh, domicile with JFK and LaGuardia. And, and I knew I was going to be there and, uh, I said, Hey man, are you doing a New York overnight? Yeah. Yeah. So hop on the uh the subway and we met up and uh hung out downtown do you remember did we go to it, it was a pub it's irish pub of some sort it was the german hall was it german yeah it wasn't hofbrau house it was uh some other rickenbacker hall okay rickenbacker hall yes where they had the boot with the 
I don't think oh, yeah, either yeah, yeah. one of us uh, dared. Uh, <laughs> God, you've got so much the, better memory than I do. And we went to the we went to Times Square. I remember. Uh, you yeah, had we your, got the picture in Times Square. Yeah. That's right. And you had your you had your some of your flight attendants with us, didn't you? Uh, I don't remember if it was a flight. I, I remember, remember your first officer. First maybe? officer. Yeah. Was first officer. Yeah. So that was a, that was an exciting night. That was the first time I saw some of the characters there in Times Square. Uh, oh yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> I saw a. Looked like a coked up Minnie Mouse and yeah, <laughs> the naked cowboy the, the, and <laughs> the, what was it the naked cowboy? I don't know if yeah. he was there or not. Oh, yeah, yeah, man, and it was cold too. It was winter time. Just yeah, saying. I think that we hadn't I hadn't seen you since um. That might have been the first time I had seen you since Eagle. I know we since had talked Eagle. on and off, but I think as you know, as far as meeting up, and having a beer, I think it's the first time I had, I had seen you in quite a while. First time you see me since oh the Sandpiper. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Ah. Um. Yeah, that was fun, and and that was really cool to to hang out. We had a great experience, but it wasn't long thereafter that I received a phone call, and you said, "Hey, guess what? I've got an offer to go over through a flow through agreement. One a very rare flow through yeah. agreement uh, because of the merger, and maybe you can shed a little bit more light on that because of the merger with." Uh, NWA and Delta. Yeah. Um, there was an agreement that a yep. was it a particular number of pilots from Compass were going to be able to flow through to what we call Acme Airlines. Yes, it was. And I'm trying to remember the specific. Uh, I believe it was uh, any class that they had. I think they had to take maybe it was up to 20 pilots a month, um, and it could only be a quarter of the compass seniority list in any rolling 12 months. Oh. Uh, but all those people went first. So they had a class of 40 people, first 20 people they called, they called up from compass and then the rest they hired through their normal uh, hiring means. And so, and in order to keep, you know, them from just draining compass, they had that limit, I think of 25% of the seniority list yeah. uh, could only go. So, and then the other limit, I believe, wasn't really a limit, but they uh, they said due to operational needs, they can hold you back for up to ninety days. Hmm. Which, of course, they just held you back ninety days. Um, so once you got the offer, got the class, you know, the class date was separate from your flow date, I guess, by ninety days because they kept you at uh, hmm. at Compass while they figured out how they're gonna how they're gonna replace you. Mm-hmm. So, so and that did go on forever. I don't believe that's not going on right now. Is no, it? no, it's not going on now. And actually it, uh, it almost died twice. And so there's, there's a lot of us that, you know, you're talking about being lucky and fortunate for, mm-hmm. first of all, just the fact that that was able to transpire in the first place. Like you said, it's very rare that any flow agreement works anywhere. Yeah. Um, I think that might, to my knowledge, that's the only one I can think of that actually worked as designed. You know, to where like, hey, we need these pilots. We've got this agreement. You know, and they flow up. And of course, the corollary to that was, if Northwest was to furlough, every seat at Compass was available. So they, so you knew that, okay, well, if Northwest ever furloughs, then I don't have a job. It bumps me out. You know, so those guys can, yeah. can fly. So that was kind of the trade off there. But yeah, once the uh, once the merger happened, um, and I'm not privy to the exact details, but there is a pretty in depth discussion. You know, on whether whether that was going to continue and they decided not that it was going to be cut off. Like there's no more flow, Mm. but they were going to grandfather all the people uh, up to that date uh, that were on property at compass. And so, and I think, I think to include, I think to include the people that had interviewed and accepted a job, but hadn't finished training yet. So, but anybody subsequently hired at compass, it was made very clear. Like, no, you do not have any flow rights. I see. So it was a short-lived agreement, uh, but one that you were able to take full advantage of, and I congratulate you for that. Talk about a yeah, well, a great opportunity, and you ended up in the right seat of an MD eighty eight. <laughs> yep. And how did that training go? Oh wow! I'll tell you, going from a um, going from a glass cockpit automated, you know, auto thrust, you know, just easy to fly, just great flying airplane, uh, to what amounts to like sixties technology with seventies technology staple on top of it with a few 80 technology sprinkled in. <laughs> it was everything manual. 
yeah. you know, like 15, 18 items on after flow checklist. Uh, yeah, it was a lot. So, and yeah. it was, not only was that aircraft, um, tough to learn, the training was excellent, but it was tough, but you have all this added pressure of, well, one, like, Hey, this is, this is like, this should be the rest of my career. Like, this is what people work for. This is why we do this. This is what we've dreamed of, you know, and I'm finally here. I cannot mess this up. Yeah. You know, and then especially under the circumstances, like, you know, I made the choices that I made, but I had no idea it could work out like that. It could have easily all blown up in my face, you know, so, so I was more than fortunate to be in the position I was. So, well, now it's double pressure that like, I really cannot screw this up. Yeah. And so, that um, training went okay. Everything, uh, learning an aircraft yeah, training, that was uh, older than you are. Yeah. Training. Yeah. Just about, <laughs> yeah, no training went great. It was, um, you know, it's like you do in training. You just study, 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 cram, eat a little bit, sleep when you can and study. And you don't, you know, you, you, that's, that's your life is learning that aircraft, you know, and learning the new company too. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I'd been, you know, through two other companies and like kind of, you know, it's kind of like when you go to your second aircraft, you know, it's easier than the first and the third's easier than the second or about the same as the second. Cause once you kind of get the process of the way things work, you get the gist of it and it's, you know, just different things on the same subject. Right. Different ways but, of uh, doing certain things. Sure. Right. So, uh, but yeah, I was like, okay, the rest of the world shuts off. You learn this airplane and learn the new airline and then, you know, you pop out at the end of it you know, a better person for it. Yeah. What was the biggest challenge in learning, uh, you know, your first class at a, a legacy carrier? What, uh, what was the biggest hurdle? Um, biggest hurdle was probably, well, I mean, there were many, I don't know if it's the biggest, but like the, the first biggest shock and maybe the biggest stressor, uh, I guess was just the initial systems on the aircraft, you know, cause that, you know, at Sandpiper, we had, you know, two, at least two weeks, I think, of nothing but aircraft systems and you know and the people that were teaching us were outstanding they knew the airplanes in and out you sat there you had all their manuals out and off the top of their head they're like oh if you look in you know section six page two or three somewhere in there you'll see this oh yeah and there's a change bar about like that let me tell you why that's there that's because you know eight years ago you know we had this thing happen it progressed to the, i mean you just learned the airplane in and out you know how many rivets you know were on the apu housing you know and they taught you all this and knew it um and when you get, you know, I'm not sure how legacy is, but like at Acme, you know, you're expected to show it with your A game. They give you the materials like these are the things you need to know. And, you know, you have your, you know, FA approved computer training courses and things you go through and you have your, you know, list of exam questions. And, you know, it can come out of this pool kind of like your ATP. And then, you know, you show up and you only have two days of class or so. To where like okay we're gonna go over a general review just to make sure we can clear up any you know any questions you may have and then it's hey you're taking your system stat yeah so you're just expected to perform off the bat (laughs) you know and it and it wasn't all easy cut and dry questions so like there might not be any wrong answers you're just supposed to pick the one that seems the most correct yeah you know so uh, so yeah that was extremely nerve wracking yeah so two years on that airplane Uh, favorite Mm -hmm. destination on the MD eighty eight at Acme. Oh, wow. Um, now you've got me trying to remember which was 88 and which was Airbus because we go a lot of the same places. Um, I, I might actually say, because I'm, I'm actually going to Cozumel tomorrow, We like I remember there's one trip on reserve because uh, I was on reserve most of the time on that aircraft. I got called up. We went down and we had two 18 or 20 hour overnights in a row in Cancun. And it just happened to be a senior captain or whatever. And I guess his FO called out sick and I was the next person to be called. So it's like, oh, I have to go lay on the beach in Cancun for the night. And, oh, we get to come back and do this tomorrow. So, so that was actually, but that was like a mini vacation for a week. So that was one of the few times yeah. I enjoyed, enjoyed reserve. Yeah. And then, so what uh, sparked the Airbus change? Was it just an opportunity or how, how did you come about that change? Um, Airbus was initially what I wanted. So, uh, in class, you know, they say, all right, these are the bases. These are the aircraft at these bases. Um, you know, they call that your drop. So what's your classes drop? Well, we had, you know, this many aircraft in this space, this many aircraft in this space. And 
the vast majority of my uh, class was New York. And in New York, we had a choice of three aircraft. You could be the 73, the 88, uh, or the uh, Airbus. And I've like, well, always loved the Airbus. Um, that's just fascinating. Well, you can, there's more backstory with that. But uh, Airbus is aircraft I really wanted. Um, but New York was a junior base. It was a tougher commute. Um, I'm like, well, what's going to get me back to the base I want the fastest? Well, the 88 was going to get me to that base the quickest. It seemed like only a month yeah. I could transfer to that. Plus, it gave me the best seniority because no one wanted to be on the 88. They wanted to be on the 73 or the bus. They wanted a nicer aircraft. So uh, your seniority went up a lot. So, you know, I got a line much. I was would have been able to get a line much sooner get off reserve, have better relatives than you're in the aircraft. So they're like, you know what? It's not what I want. It's a tough aircraft, but I'm going to tough it out. And I had the advantage that I had uh, a friend from Compass that had gone before me several years uh, that had been on the DC-9 and then the 88 and had come from the same aircraft, obviously, at, at Compass flying the Embraer that, you know, kind of told me like, oh, it's tough, but these are things and this is how you do it. So I kind of had a little bit of insight as to what I was getting into with that aircraft. Sure. Um, so that's where I took it. So then once the seniority on their bus caught up, it's like, well, I'm going to go fly something with a tray table for a while. There you go. <laughs> and get rid of this, the, 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 uh, all, all the loud noise and the eyebrows that are constantly, uh, dripping water on you from the, uh, from the rain and the de-ice and, yep. you know, the center the side console is full of de-ice fluid and the noise and, the uh, and, and just the whole aircraft. It's, a uh, I mean, they're still flying to this day. They're stout aircraft, yeah. Um, but they're not easy or comfortable or very user friendly at all. You know, some people love them. I don't really care for it. Has Acme uh, said how long they're going to keep flying that aircraft for, or do they have a projected uh, retirement date for that? They do, and their five year plan I think changes around every three months. So, oh. uh, <laughs> yeah. so I think now the numbers are finally starting to dwindle. Uh, I don't want to say either by the end of this year or uh, first quarter next year. I think they're all projected to uh, to be gone, but a lot of that depends on training and availability and you know other aircraft deliveries because it was, it was a big fleet, you know. So there's a lot of flying there to cover as those aircraft uh, age out. Yeah. So um, they're obviously not very fuel efficient. But uh, but but they're paid for. They're paid off, man. So no, no, that's no know, car you loan. The, you know, <laughs> payments on a new Airbus or a new seven three nine. You know, that's uh, yeah, it's n- nowhere near what it would be to operate those. And so, so they've been you know, been doing well. But you know, slowly but surely, you know, the the maintenance on them uh, starting to catch up. Not in the aspect that they're bad or you know, bad maintained. We've got a fantastic you know tech ops maintenance department. You know, but. You know, they're having to work double, triple, triple hard to keep everything up and going and keep reserves and spare engines and so forth. Right. Um, so it's just the the economy of operating that aircraft is, is really, I guess, uh, what's going to kill it, not the uh, actual usefulness of it. Yeah. So let's say you can go back in your journey just for mm-hmm. a moment and whisper in your own ear at a younger self. Maybe when you're just starting out in this aviation journey, what would you go back and tell yourself? Oh wow! Wow, that one might take. Well, that's a good question. Um, first, I tell tell myself I wouldn't believe myself, but I'll tell myself like everything's going to be fine. Just you know, there's good and bad to everything. Just hang in there, you know, do your best, and it'll all work out. Even when you don't think it's working out, it's working out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things. I, I'm really not sure what I'd tell myself. Like I said, like I'm not sure if I'd believe myself. You know, kind of knowing the future because you know there's so many, you know, different circumstances, different paths, you know, to the same place. That you know, you look at one person's journey and you compare it to another's, and like they're not even close to being the same. And like we're at the same spot. Yeah. So, I mean, like even you and I, if you look at, you know, look at your journey, look at mine, like we, we started at the same place and yeah. in essence, we ended at the same place, you know, we're flying we at major carriers, both flying yeah. an Airbus. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, but completely, you know, 
and, and relatively, I think the same seniority, you know, so it's not like we're really one is ahead of the other that much. Uh, yeah. You know, it's been relatively. amazing how it's worked out for us, huh? Exactly. But, but even with us starting and ending the same spots, those are two different lines. You know, when you draw out our career paths, you know, and they both have their ups and downs. So, so have you had a moment that, uh, you know, if you can go, okay, from today, looking backwards, what has been kind of the, like the most inspiring or, or pivotal moment in your aviation journey? What would that moment be? I would say that one easily would have to be my decision uh, to leave Sandpiper for company. Because, you know, at the time and the circumstances of it, it was, you know, at best a lateral move. If anything, it was a step, you know, step backwards, and it was definitely a big step into a lot of uncertainty. Um, you know, there was a lot of, well, I've worked this hard, put forth this effort to get somewhere, and now I'm going to kind of just step back from it and, and kind of reboot. And uh, and yeah, it was definitely a time to where you know I didn't necessarily go into it thinking like, hey, this is this is great, this is my best move, you know, like when I just made the choice to, you know leave other professions and go into aviation. Like I was a hundred percent like, yeah, this is what I want to do. And I got there and yeah, it's working out. You know, when Sam Piper called like, Oh, this is great. I get to go there and you can pass and you get going like, wow, I'm an airline pilot now. Like this is, you know, stuff people dream of something I've dreamed of. Like this is working out. That was a great decision. You know? Yeah. The decision to just step back from that, you know, and, and, and take a side step was, yeah. Yeah. That wasn't full of confidence. Even when I was there, uh, you know, in that second airline, when that, when that career went down that path, like it, it still wasn't obvious that was right. It was only in hindsight that that was a great decision. Yeah. So, um, and, and so, yeah, that would have made, you know, I say it would have made the difference, but back to my original point, you know, had I stayed there, you and I were there at the same time, I would only have to assume that we'd more or less, you know, I'd pop out the end about where I am now. Yeah. You know, it's like, and, and you can never, you can never really predict those things. You know, this is such a, you know, finicky industry, you know, it's timing and luck. Yeah, it really you know, you'll is. You'll hear that over and over. That's what it boils down to. It's like, you can, you know, you can do the right things and not get anywhere and you can kind of, you know, make a few mistakes here and there and come out, you know, come out shining. So, mm -hmm. so I guess that's the biggest thing. Like if you really, you know, if you think this is something you want to do, you just have to put your mind to it and work towards it. and you know, you, you equip yourself with the right knowledge and do your best to put yourself in the right position. But what kind of happens just happens. Yeah. Well, you have to adapt to your scenario. I mean, that's kind of what exactly. we do in the, in the flight deck as well. You know, you've been doing this a long time, uh, at least long enough mm -hmm. to have enough experience to be considered, uh, maybe not, a, I hate to say the word expert, but let's just say uh, very knowledgeable in your field. Um, okay. And doing this as long as you have, you know, earning your position at a legacy carrier uh, that, you know, you're, you're pretty much done. I mean, unless something bigger and better comes along or something disastrous happens, you know, this is, this is it. I mean, you and I have kind of discussed this in the past. We've reached the tip of the pyramid, and now it's yeah. our job to protect it. Um, so, you know, looking back, if you were to give some advice to a young aviator who is currently pursuing a career in aviation in today's marketplace, knowing mm -hmm. the, the demands of the job, knowing how our progression is not necessarily something that a today's aviator will go through in, in the identical fashion because both technology, the industry, the economy, everything has developed. Uh, mm -hmm. What's the best advice you can give someone who's just starting out? I would say you I would say you should focus on what you want to do, not necessarily where you're doing it. Um, and like to expand on that, we've had two different choices. We're basically doing the same thing, but we're in two different places, mm -hmm. you know, two different carriers, two different cities even. Um, but we're still flying an airbus, we're still flying trips, you know, we're doing what we love. So, you know, the paths to get there, if I think if you're trying to really nail that, I don't want to tell someone to give up. Like if you just really wanted to fly for 
carrier X, Y, Z, you know, or if your, you know, mom flew there or whoever, like, you know, don't give up on that goal. But to a certain extent, just know what you want to do. And if you don't get get there, you might wind up, you know, doing what you love, but just at a different place. Yeah. Um, For example, you know, growing up close to Memphis, you know, everything was FedEx. FedEx is, you know, one of the, you know, large, one of the largest companies in the, you know, in the country and definitely, you know, the dominant country in Memphis, you know, you get anywhere near Memphis and it's like, Oh, you're a pilot. Oh, well, so-and-so flies for FedEx, you know, so, uh, so so that was kind of the goal, you know, all through flights, because like, I want to get to FedEx and, you know, and your instructor's instructor, you know, was, was at a regional and his instructor was at FedEx. So everybody kind of knew someone there. And that was my goal. Like even in my compass interview, when they said, Hey, you know, this isn't, this isn't a compass interview. This is a Northwest interview. You know, we're Northwest pilots, you know, and you know, what, what do you think about that? You know, you're going to be a, you're going to be a red tail someday. You know, even in that interview, I told them like, it's an amazing opportunity. I really hope that works out. You know, that's, uh, you know, that's something that, you know, people dream of. It's a little outside of my career goals. Obviously if that opportunity comes up, I'm definitely going to take it. You know, but that's that's not really necessarily well. That's not the reason I'm coming here. Yeah. They kind of looked at me like, really? This because they kind of put them off. Like you're, and it's kind of a how, dumb move on my yeah. part. I'm basically telling you? someone, it's like, yeah, I don't really <laughs> want to be here. But uh, but I wanted to be honest and transparent with them. And so yeah. I said, and they're like, well, what are your, what do you mean, career goals? And I told them like, oh, I'm from you know close to Memphis. And, you know, I've got you know friends and family at FedEx and. That's where I want to fly. That's my goal. That's where I want to get to. And, you know, and they're very selective on their pilots and requirements to get there. So I'm trying to build towards that goal. Like if it, if it doesn't happen, then excuse me, if it doesn't happen, that's fine. But you know, that's, that's my end goal. So yeah. I'm like, Oh, well, yeah. I'm like, this could be a bit, I like, I could get to North if the Northwest works out, Hey, that might be a better deal. And I might be thankful for being there, but you know, that's yeah. not my end goal. And so, and you know, and at the time, you know, no one could see Compass working out. You know, it could have, could not have worked out. No one saw these mergers coming amongst major carriers, you know. So, you know, some of the carrier, oh, I wanted to work for, you know, name a carrier. I wanted to work for uh, U.S. Air. Well, there's no U.S. Air anymore. Right. You know, the carrier doesn't even exist. You know, it's folded in, become their culture, it's become part of another culture. Mm-hmm. So, um, so to say, like, oh, I want to be at this place, um, I think it might hamper you to a certain extent. Well, not even hamper. I don't want to say that. I retract that statement. You can't, um, you can't, sometimes getting from point A to point B means going through point A1, 2, A3, A4, A5 to get to point, you know, finally B. But yeah. And maybe by the time you get there, you realize, well, B is no longer in existence. Now you need to go to D. So yeah, right. you have to be flexible. The industry is very cyclical. We've we've thrown these words around many many times for many years, um, but you know it's very true. Uh, if your end goal, and I've said it before as well in in the podcast, that you're making a very very good point that you know if your goal is to go fly for, you know the uh, the carrier a cargo carrier like FedEx, then you know maybe you're not going to go from flying a 172 directly to FedEx. Obviously, you're going to have to take steps and everybody's career progression is going to be a little bit different. Their choices will be different dependent upon, you know, the timing, the placement, and the luck. Um, so you could get there eventually. Or yeah. You might go your entire career with your eye on that prize and never get it. So you have to kind of reassess every, every once in a while. So, yeah, that, that's, that's some great advice to, to always shoot for your goal, but don't, um, don't get stagnant and, and say, well, I'm going to just keep applying until they hire me. Well, maybe you can do some side shuffles. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you're, you're uh, flying along at one of the biggest carriers in the country uh, with one of the largest pilot groups in the countries. We often talk about conflicting personalities. And as a right seat driver, a co-pilot, a co-captain, a first officer, whatever you want to call it. As the right seat driver, we do have some conflicting personalities that, unfortunately, we don't dictate the tone of the flight deck. That's the captain's job. Um, so we have to kind of put on this chameleon skin sometimes and adapt 
uh, we often say cooperate and graduate, you know, uh, make your time as uh, enjoyable as possible, as painless as possible. So how do you deal with conflicting personalities in the cockpit? What's some of the tools that you use to try to mitigate those issues? I like that you said chameleon, because that was actually the word I was being prepared to to use. Like, you really do have to uh, adapt, because, you know, especially, you know, most pilots are A-type. You know, they're very task-goal-oriented. You know, they're very finicky in the ways they want things done, and ways to do things. So you have all these standard operating procedures, um, you know, but at the end of the day, you know, the captain's the captain. He's running the ship. So. Uh, I think more so that's the biggest delineator in the difference differences between a captain and the first officer, you know, because, you know, at its core, we're both doing the same thing. You fly one leg, I fly one leg, you know, you run the radios, I run the radios. There's a clear vision of, all right, you know, if there's some emergency, you know, whoever's flying the airplane, fly the airplane priority. Then we divide up, divide duties, you know, and so forth. Um, but outside of that, you know, the first officer, you're there to back up the captain. You're there to, you know, it's sometimes it's a fine line. Like if something's happening that needs to be brought to his attention that you think's going wrong, like you have to speak up and say something. Well, you, you've got to fly a trip for, you know, two, three, four days. Like you don't want to, you know, you know, tick the guy off. You don't want to insult him. Um, you know, and at the end of the day, there might be very good reasons for what he's doing or what he's suggesting. You know, maybe he's, you know, not doing something explicitly, you know, dangerous or wrong. You know, but something you might think could be done better, um, or maybe there's a change in your procedure and he's doing it the old way and you've got the new way to do it. And it's really one of those things that you just, like you said, you have to be a chameleon. You have to, um, you know, figure out ways to, you know, deal with a personality that uh, that may conflict with yours. You know, most other office type, you know, as I like to you know, tell my wife, oh, people with real jobs. You know, they're working in an environment to where like, yeah, you're not right next to that person locked in a little room with them. So if you have some kind of conflict. Yeah. Like it, it like it can't get in the way of what you're doing. Yeah. Um, or at least for those four days, you know, after you're off the trip, you know, I think every different company has their you know means of like, well, you know, he's a great guy, but I don't do, you know, don't get along with him. I'm sure you've had this experience to where like you don't like flying with the guy at the overnights, you know, he's a hoot. You know, like great guy, great. You know, you can go out and you know have a beer and have a good time with them. But you get in the cockpit, it's almost like a different person. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, you have to be able to, like that's our job. It's our job as first officer isn't to obviously isn't to manage the aircraft. It's not necessarily to fly the aircraft. Our job is to be able to chameleon and be able to back up the captain. Yeah. So, um, so and I'm generally a very non-confrontational person. So it takes a lot for me to to speak up because I'm not the type that wants to step on somebody's toes or, you know, insult somebody or, you know, anger somebody. I don't just very conflict diverse. So that's something I have to actively consciously think about, you know, and work on. So if something happens, it's like, Hey, did you, um, did you want that? I'm sorry. Did you want that on? No. Okay. That's fine. Um, are you sure about that? Or, you know, um, so there's just, there's different methods of managing that, you know, different levels. Sometimes there's a suggestion you thinking, oh, is that something that can slide? Or is that something like, you know what, it, at this point, no, it, this needs to be said. That's not right. This needs to be done. Yeah. Or this needs to be said. Um, to a certain extent, I'm hearing you say you have to kind of pick your battles. Yeah. You know, because there's some things, you know, like the, at the end of the day, like, okay, that's not, you know, it's technically, technically not correct, but you're not breaking a regulation. You're really not jeopardizing any safety if something's just wrong. Like, well, okay. Do that your way. Yeah. Technique versus, uh, you know, standard operating procedures, which exactly. that is the rules we live by here at the, uh, at the big, uh, the big boys. Yeah. And especially when they change as often as they do. <laughs> yeah. Have, you guys you know, getting updates years, every <laughs> years of the, They're not doing it wrong because they don't know any better. They've done it this way because that's the way we've done it for 18 years. Now all of a sudden they're like, oh yeah, we're not going to turn the switch on at that time. We're going to turn it on this other time. I was uh, reading an article by uh, by uh, someone, I forget who, who wrote it, but they were talking about uh, business management. And they were saying the most damaging line in business is 
but that's the way we've always done it. <laughs> and it really, it, it, it's very true. Uh, do you have a favorite destination? Um, home. <laughs> What's that? Where's that? What's that about home? Yeah, What's actually, it's in Nashville. Word? I live yeah. in Nashville. Oh, and so I'll, Nashville now. Although I was joking, we do fly through Nashville. So I have had instances to where I've had Nashville overnight. So basically, you get a free night at home. There you so go. You get to sleep in. They're your home. rare, rare and far between, but yeah. they do happen. Yeah. So, um, outside of that, I don't know. I like Boston a lot. Boston's a great city. Oh yeah, very like good. There's, yeah. There's you know there's plenty of new stuff. There's plenty you know obviously tons of history. You know there's uh, outstanding Italian food. Go to the North End. Go to yeah. Mike's, pick up some cannoli. Oh yeah, it's, uh, Bo- Boston's one of my favorite places. I'm gonna have to. You're gonna have to shoot me that address, and I'll go check that place out. You don't know Mike's? Oh boy, I don't. I don't know. We we kind of stay like four different hotels in Boston, so it's always somewhere different, like different part of town. Yeah. We don't really stay downtown as as often as I'd like. Yeah. Um, you've been flying a while. Have you had a really bad emergency situation, and how did you handle it? Luckily, no. I'm trying to think of what the worst. Or what I would consider the worst things that would happen. Um, I know one time on the Embraer on the 175, and it was long enough. I don't remember the exact. Uh, it wasn't a flight computer, but one of the other secondary tertiary computers uh, went out, and the things we lost weren't that bad. But the biggest thing was like, oh, you lost nose wheel steering. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, so now I've got to land an airplane and I can't steer. So we. You know, we're on the phone with maintenance, you know, division of duties, you know, we flew away, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so um, I think we landed in Louisville. And so, you know, we used, you know, the lowest, you know, max flap setting we could use, you know, lowest approach speed, longest runway. We had, you know, 11, whatever, 11,000 foot, the longest runway there, 10,000 at, at Louisville. Um, and I was just you know, like, I'm just like, I don't think this is going to be a big deal at all. I think we're pretty much just going to land and roll out and that's going to be the end of it. But I mean, you know, the nose wheel steering isn't working. I don't know if the nose wheel is straight. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> like, eh, I don't know how this is going to come out. So, you know, I briefed the flight attendants thoroughly, you know, the FO, we had everything planned, you know, trucks and stuff were standing by. And it was, you know, a, kind of your basic everyday landing. We just rolled straight. You know, we had a little bit of directional control with the brakes at low speed. And we just rolled to a stop and stop. And I said, hey, you know, we're going to stop on the runway. They knew that. They came up, look, no, we don't see, you know, we don't see. We knew we didn't have any damage because it was a computer that went out. Um, but yeah, so we're like, all right, well, we'll just, we're, we're going to test it. Yeah, nose wheel steering didn't work. All right, we'll need to be towed off the runway. It's like, okay, yeah, we've advised your company's on the way. So we had to wait for uh, the slowest tug in the world come all the way from the terminal down to that end of the field hook up and bring us all the way back to the terminal. Yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe that was the worst one time on the 88. I think we had one of the pressurization controllers was, uh, on MEL. Um, and so we were on the second controller, uh, and took off an IMC and I don't know, four or 5,000 feet. We get a message and look and the secondary isn't working. We're like, Oh, well maybe if we had the, one that's MEL selected, so we toggle it. No, that one doesn't work. Second one doesn't work. Cabin pressure's coming up. And captain leveled it off at, you know, told ATC leveled off at seven, 8,000 feet, whatever it was. I'm like, well, this is not working. It's IMC. We're not doing this. Just tell them we're coming back. Okay, fine. So we landed, got back uh, back to Atlanta, and they are on the way back in. They already had another plane, like, waiting for us and so <laughs> of course so, so we get off of that one left and go back to the other one so yeah so knock on wood luckily you know nothing major feel good boring is good yeah no engine failures no fires no no craziness yeah well uh one final question for you i want you to take a moment and think back to one person that most influenced your journey that most inspired you to follow your dreams and really was a just pivotal point in your journey in your career, in your career progression here in aviation, who would that person be? And what, if they were sitting right next to you right now, what would you tell them? You know, that's another tough one because along the way, there's so many people, um, whether it's just an influence uh, or a mentor type. Um, 
I don't think I've had any one particular person that was really, you know, there the whole way pushing me towards anything or guiding me. Um, one thing that has stuck with me, though, I remember early on at uh, at uh, Sandpiper, uh, I was fine. I might have even been on OE. I think it was just after OE, actually. But uh, but he knew I was new, like really green. But the captain I was fine with. Great, great guy. One of those really easy captains to fly with. He's one of those people you look at and you're like, yeah, that's the guy I want to be because, you know, everything just kind of goes well. He makes you feel comfortable at home you know, operate aircraft well. And he said something that stuck with me and I remembered it my whole time at Sandpiper and it came up, you know, I'm an upgrade and it comes up when you, you know, when you're working with other captains, kind of like when you said, you know, well, how do you manage these different personalities in the cockpit? He said, a, uh, a bad captain will take the tiniest thing and blow it up into something it's not. And like, it just really make it a problem. Like a really good captain is the one that can take these huge problems and make them seem like nothing mm. and so and and i've had that experience on and off to where you know things are are going a little sideways and you're getting tense or you're getting upset and you're like are things really going this bad or is this other guy just really having a bad day yeah you know and then other times there's you know you're flying with someone and you know you're you know it's like oh we got to go de-ice and now something fell. Oh, we got to go back to the gate and like, oh, when are we going to time out? You know, and all these different things happening. And things are going just, you know, smooth and easy. You're not stressed and, you know, you're focused at the task at hand. So, um, yeah, no, no really one person I can think of. But that's, I think, some of the best advice, you know, going forward, both in explicit advice and something to kind of reflect on is that, yeah, yeah. A, a poor captain's going to make a small situation seem difficult, and a good captain can take the big situations and make them seem minor. Yeah, that's some great advice, actually, because that's so true. Yeah, yeah. It's, I wish I could remember that captain's name. Um, I don't think it's just captains either. I, I, I truly believe that it. You can put pilot in front of that statement, and a good pilot will make the oh, big things seem. That's small. very true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I know uh, we're both on uh, layovers uh, and it's getting late for you. We both have some pretty early uh, wake ups tomorrow. So I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us and give us a little bit of a window to your journey in aviation. Are there any final thoughts that you'd like to get out there before we uh, wrap it up tonight? Uh no, not really. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to, you know, be on the show. Yeah. No, I'm very excited uh to to have been given this opportunity to sit down and interview you. Uh I've been looking forward to this to for some quite some time now. Um and I appreciate all of your support in the show. Um you know, you've been kind of uh going back and forth with me with messages and phone calls and whatnot <laughs> and uh, and and it's, I really do appreciate. Uh, oh, no, you're more than welcome. Of, I mean, that's kind just kind of, of the life, you know, you're <laughs> you know, you're juggling with 18 balls in there at the same time. That's just kind of the life of an airline pilot. Yep. And let me just say, officially, congratulations, soon to be a <laughs> yep. father. Yep. That's got to be exciting. Your first. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it, it's exciting and terrifying at the same time. So. I just want to say, you know, congratulations, uh, you know, for some exciting news coming up yeah. how many weeks away are you oh wow uh april 22nd so we're allegedly april 22nd you know that's the due date whether he comes in or a few days early is yet to be seen but um so yeah that's what another it seems like it was eight months just about a day or two ago well that, all of a sudden it's right here that math so. does kind of add up I don't yeah know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah one day they're crawling two weeks later they're driving right? yeah oh trust me uh, mine had her 14th birthday just yesterday oh wow yeah she's quite the lady and she reminds me of it every day and uh, in a couple years i don't know how it's gonna happen but she's very <laughs> insistent that she wants a tesla so oh boy. yeah, daddy's gonna be doing a lot of overtime. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Picking up trips left and right. Maybe I'll get her a little Hot Wheels Tesla because that's pretty much there you go. That's all I'm gonna be able she to. She wants like a real one or like a power wheel. She wants know? like the, she wants a full on Tesla, man. But she doesn't want to yeah. drive. 
Can you imagine? I don't, I don't get it. I was like, she doesn't want to drive. I was driving at 15 and a half with my permit and my 16th birthday, I got my license and I was driving up and down the hills in San Francisco, going down Lombard and, you know, oh, driving wow. up to Coit tower with my buddy and in, in, in my little, uh, five speed stick shift Fiat. I mean, convertible. You had a Fiat? I had a Fiat X19 convertible. And, you know, oh, wow. She's like, no, I don't want to drive, Dad. I don't, I don't No, I, I had don't a Ford Ranger and it was a manual transmission and uh, my parents that had never, you know, obviously my parents can drive a stick, but they never had one. You know how I learned how to drive a stick? I got one. But, yeah. All right, there's a truck. Go drive it. Okay. That is we'll what we call the uh, millennial anti-theft device. There you go. <laughs> Just uh, And that's, my next car is going to be a manual transmission and you know, not paddle shifters. We're talking five or six on the actual floor. Actual manual. Yeah, actual manual. Yeah, and no one will ever, they'll get in it and they'll be like, oh, what do I do now? <laughs> hey, yeah. Hey, get you a, get you a, <laughs> sounds silly. I've got a Miata. Get a Miata. And you know what the, you know what the number one anti-theft device is? Who's that? The club. The club. <laughs> it, statistically, it's still to this day, the number one theft deterrent because it not only protects from theft, it also protects from stealing an airbag. Wow. Okay. Which is very expensive. That's yeah. kind of a shocker, especially, I guess, after all the recalls. I guess. Yeah. I don't know. This is a new one on me. Go figure. I don't know how we got on this subject, but no, <laughs> going off on a rat hole. Yeah. Funny story, though, because while we're here, my, uh, my uncle, his grandkids, he had gotten a, um, a new truck, a new work truck, and it was basically a fleet truck. So, you know, pretty stripped down. And this was years ago, 10 years ago, but it was a pretty stripped down basic truck, you know, vinyl seat, so forth. And uh, he had it at the house, and uh, his uh, his grandkids came running in to their mom. They're like, "Mom, mom, you got to see Grandpa's new truck. This is so cool. You'll never believe this. This is awesome. Check this out. It does all this cool stuff." They're like, "Okay." So they go out there. He runs over and and like you know he's what, six, seven years old. Pops the door open. He's like, "Watch this!" And he does his hand in a little cranking motion and uh, rolls down the window. He's uh, like, "This is so cool. It's got a knob that makes the window work." Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Because now oh, everything's like, oh, electric. That's shocking. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What would they think of next? You know, yeah. you've never seen that. You know, you know what was impressive when I was, uh, you know, a young driver and I'm driving down the road and, you know, I am, uh, I'm rolling down the window. I'm shifting gears. I'm turning the corner, flipping the flipper or the turn <laughs> signal and giving the guy next to me the bird all at the same time. And you're like, how's he doing all this? <laughs> what? <You> know? <laughs> yeah. Mm. Anyway. Well, Matt, I just want to say thank you again for spending the time to share your story and your journey with this grateful aviator. You know, I wish you the very best. Congratulations again on uh, your number one uh, first child on the way. And thank you. You know, please give uh, my best to your lovely wife. And, you know, hey, growing up in Nashville ain't bad, huh? No, not at all. Not at all. Well, uh, you know, I look forward to uh, speaking with you again. Thanks again for yeah. coming on to the show. Yeah, we'll have to talk soon. Fly safe. All right. Thank you. You too. Well, ladies and gentlemen, episode 29 is in the books. Are you enjoying Squawk Ident? I hope so. Please visit our website at aviatortony.com. That's Alpha Victor, the number eight, Romeo Tango, Oscar November Yankee.com. There you can check out uh, episode cover art the episode archives, the pilot shop, and you can leave audio feedback or just send us an email. And now, check out the Flight Line Photos tab, where I post as many of the photos that I have from the Flight Line as possible, so you guys can kind of get a look and see what our view from our office is like. Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter users can search Squawk Ident Podcast or Aviator Tony and Squawk Ident to follow on the socials. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts and you like what you hear, it would be wonderful if you could just leave us a quick review and share the show with someone who you might think would enjoy Squawk Ident. In closing, I would just like to say thank you for taking the time to listen to this grateful aviator. Keep the dirty side down, be safe, and take care of each other.